Nikola Jokic. The practitioner of the Sambor Shuffle. The man who can pirouette into a one-footed, left-handed fadeaway from the corner without leaving the ground. And looking entirely unathletic. And looking entirely unathletic. It's amazing. The man whose only running came at the expense of the neighborhood ice cream truck, who was so unathletic he could not even do a single push-up when he joined the NBA. (sighs) The two-time reigning MVP of the NBA with the highest player efficiency rating in history, topping even the great Michael Jordan and Wilt Chamberlain. Wow, I did not know that. Nikola Jokic. 1995, born in Sambor, Serbia, which is why it's the Sambor Shuffle. Mm. He has two brothers, both older, both giants. Yep. Sambor sits in the northwestern part of Serbia. And the northwestern part of Serbia is part of an autonomous province called Vojvodin. And the land. The place where Jokic was born, my theory that I'm going to present to you here is that it's, its immigrant story is the more important one. Hmm. Here's Jokic's immigration interview. 1995, he's born. He comes to the NBA probably on a P1 or O1 non-immigrant visa. Right. Okay. Now as the MVP, he has extraordinary ability. He could apply for the EB1 green card and actually become an immigrant. I don't know. For those folks watching, the reason we say international players and not immigrant players is because most international players aren't immigrants. They have non-immigrant visas. And I actually wondered, you know, can everybody get EB1s? If you're just a scrub in the NBA, can you get an EB1? Question for another day. Yeah. Do you have to become an all-star to get a green card? You know? How extraordinary is your ability? She would be talking differently about international players. You know, when they make an all-star team, we're like, we're like, oh boy, he's got that green card money. Yeah. You know, he's putting up green <laughs> card numbers. He's putting up green card, you know. Yeah. That'd be funny and probably vaguely racist or not so. But not really. No, but it'd be informed because somebody's like, that's racist. He'd be like, no, I'm talking about the EB1 category visa of extraordinary ability, right. which is handed out those with internationally recognized extraordinary ability. And so, okay. But he's actually probably a non immigrant in the US. Here's the elements of his immigration story. Okay. I'm going to get to it why his land is the most important. But first, his brother played basketball at Detroit Mercy. Yeah. Okay. So his brother was probably here on an F1, which is what most, most college players are, F1 student visa. Yeah. Played at Detroit Mercy. His now wife, she finished a degree at uh, Metro State University in Minnesota. Hmm. Okay. His older brother, whose name is Strachonia, which literally means scary one. Strach is fear and one to be feared. That's too good. Uh, he played basketball in and around Europe and now lives in Colorado with the boys. Okay. And I don't know what their immigration situation would be. You know, like maybe they got petitioned for, but we know that brother petitions take like 14, 15 years. That could so, be another interesting topic is the family. Of, yeah. Uh, family well, well, I bet you, I know what it would be. If he's on an O one one sports visa, they would be on O two two visas helping the O one one person. Mm, okay. That's how you could bring in the family members. He goes O one, one they go O two, 2 where they're his assistants. Oh, wow. Interesting. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is kind of like sports visa. Okay. Um, but why is his country interesting? Okay. So we spent first part, part of the episode talking about how your citizenship defines your uh, perception of opportunities elsewhere. How the mere existence of nation states actually bakes in the fact that people are going to move around because some states frankly are better than others okay when it's 247 dollars a year that you're making in burundi almost anywhere seems better right okay i'm not a moral relativist about yeah uh we also got to touch on the fact that your perception of justice may be well we didn't touch on it but i'll touch on your perception of justice can be different depending on where you're born you know i have friends I have a doctor friend in Croatia, really successful as a company. And he goes, you know, uh, a large part of what I could be was decided by where I was born. Right. You right. And I, this is a hard concept for, um, I really had to think about this for, for a second is, you know, my, 
ability to move, you know, yeah. bodily autonomy, uh, my ability to travel. Um, that is so privileged in this, in this country. There's people who, um, yeah, whose ability to exist as a human being um, doesn't exist in many countries around the world just because of where they were born. It's, Let me ask you this. When you realized that you were like a fair-haired, blonde-haired stud <laughs> that could ride motorcycles in a country free from helmet laws, mm. and you decided you were just going to travel across a massive continent, which just happens to be a single country on your motorcycle with your shirt off, to ride alongside Trump's wall. Did you think to yourself ever, God damn, those Burundians couldn't do this. <laughs> did you ever, did you ever do it like, God damn, it feels good to be an American. Honestly, no, it's like, it's so far. Mm. Uh, yeah. For, for most of my life, it was so far. Um, I had, I hadn't conceived of that yet. It's like free freedom of movement was just so, uh, baked into like my experience of being alive, you know, the- when you go surfing <laughs> in Rhode Island or you go down to Nicaragua in the summer between your stints in this office and you stand, stay in a little thatch hut with a nice little Nicaraguan lady who makes you really simple breakfast and you meet your mm-hmm. surfing heroes while hunting 20 foot waves. Did you ever think to yourself, God damn, it feels good to be an American. Okay. That trip I did. You did. You, should. you did. <laughs> no, I mean, I. Uh, yeah. I'm very. I'm very aware of that when I yeah. when I travel to Central America. Yeah. Honestly. Um, but yeah, it's it's not. Um, it's not baked in. It all depends. Yeah. It yeah. all depends. It doesn't matter how rich you are. Uh, doesn't matter on much except for your except for your citizenship. So this brings me to Jokic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Jokic is born in Sambor, Serbia. Northern Serbia again, Vojvodina very rural area. It was the front lines of the war, the Yugoslavian wars, which raged from 1991 to 2001 in Serbia. Now they ended Mm -hmm. in Bosnia and Croatia in 1995. What the Croatians call the Croatian War of Independence has two phases. The last ends, I think, in April 1995. Bosnia War ends in November 1995, or it might be November. It doesn't matter. It all ends by the end of 1995. The wars in the Balkans, except for Serbia, have ended. Serbia still has outstanding, uh, has wars that it's going to wage with Albanians in Kosovo. And what happens in 1999, uh, there are all sorts of reports and video of uh, Serbian nationalist uh, forces who still under this time under Milosevic expelling Kosovars, Kosovar Muslims from Kosovo, um, expelling Albanians. So all this stuff is happening in Kosovo. People are getting expelled. And, yeah. And NATO, for the second time ever, uh, decides to unilaterally bomb. Uh, They bombed during the Bosnian War. Thank God Mm. that helped where my grandparents were in Sarajevo. Thank God, Mm. right, that they bombed. Uh, But they bombed Serbia. And they don't just bomb one place in Serbia. They bomb up and down all of Serbia, strategic targets from Belgrade to the outer reaches, including... Sambor, which is a small town, right? Population, what is it? Population can't be more than 40,000. Sambor population, 47,000. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So they bomb Sambor, population of 47,000. But it's very rural. 47,000 is pretty big from Serbia. Okay. Right. Pretty big. Okay. Why do they bomb Sambor? First of all, Sambor is at the intersection of Hungary, Croatia, and Serbia, okay? So it's a strategic point, and they were mil- there was military there. Yeah. They had two different gas companies, oil companies, had their depots there. Those were bombed. But there's also an intelligence center there where some reports that I've been able to find show that people, Croats and Bosniaks, um, who were taken to concentration camps as prisoners of war, would first be interrogated in Sambor and Novi Sad. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Sambor itself has a memorial to fallen soldiers from the Yugoslav wars. So we mm. know that people from there fought. And that would make sense because the most, the most violent front lines were along its edges. Mm. Okay. Vukovar was the greatest massacre of Croatians took place, uh, was is 60 miles south. 
of okay. some, or no, 43 miles south, 60 some kilometers south. 43 miles south. That's the distance from Durham to Raleigh, from Hartford to New Haven. Yeah. All right. That's, that's a small distance. This is where Nicola grows up. Okay. Mm. But not only that. So I'm not, I'm not saying he's a Serb nationalist. Go with me here. Okay. He sits at the intersection of these wars. So he grows up during a time of intense battle and he feels it. And I know his brothers felt it and his father felt it. Okay. All this energy is in the home. It's in the town. Okay. That tension. He is there during the bombing in 1999. So if, you know, you can imagine what a giant depot full of oil getting bombed is going to sound like when it blows up. Right. 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 And I, I hope we can show the video we found of this, uh, uh, of w- one place in Sambor getting bombed directly by NATO bombs. There's actually a like, video of it. He experiences that. His brothers experienced probably the frontline warfare. Right. right. And what that was like and the deprivation during that period. Yeah. Here is the history of rulers in Sambor. Okay. That being said, so this is at the intersection now of Hungary, Croatia, Serbia. This is a place where there's always been warfare. This is since the birth of Jesus, because the okay. West won the war, the real war, as yeah. Louis C.K., <laughs> who we don't like or love, or we don't like. I don't know. No, Louis C.K. Who we're conflicted about. Who we're conflicted about, I guess. <laughs> All right. Um, here, here's, the, here's the history. The Celts, Celts, then the Romans, then the Goths, then the Gepids. G-E-P-I-D-S, never heard of them. Then the Huns, heard of them. Yeah. The of Avars, haven't really heard of them. Sounds like a condiment to me, like Avar. Then the Bulgarians. <laughs> then the uh, famous country of Monrovia. Then uh, the Byzantine Empire under the Bulgarians. Yeah, all right. Forgot about that then chapter. The, then the Kingdom of Hungary. This is 11 or 1200s. Then the Ottoman Empire. Then there's a Habsburg rule, right? The Habsburg monarchy. And first it's Hungarian crown land, but then it becomes Austrian crown land. Those Hungarian Austrian historians among you can uh, correct me on that. Among all 120 listeners, I'm sure there's one of you. And then uh, the kingdom of Yugoslavia. Okay. Nazis occupy it. And uh, actually they kill all of the Jews. So Serbia is the first Juden free state. And there's wow. a record of Sambor of over 900 Jewish individuals being shipped to Auschwitz or one of the concentration camps. Okay, so that's there. That's Which the land that you live by, in. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, well, it's, it's, it's farther north, but the, the, po- the first, the experiments on liberating, uh, making a country Jude and free began in Serbia. Mm. Okay. This has always been the land of uh, terrible experimentation. <laughs> Socialist Yugoslavia and then Serbia. Okay, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 17. nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, or 17. Okay, that's a lot of change to a pat, map upon which one's house stands. Okay, so imagine you're Jokic. Imagine you could live to be 2,000 year old. If you just stood on the land where you were born and raced your horses, right? and shot basketball, you would have exchanged citizenship identities like 16 times. Okay. So you, he was essentially, he became a a type of, uh, he developed immigrant identity just standing exactly where he was. Mm. And he experienced arguably much of the pain of displacement by being present during bombing. Right. Okay. And so he's this, kid that grows up in this town, which is really small, 47,000 sounds big in a way, but really it's a small town center that you can walk through in three minutes, you know, according to his brother reading the interviews, right? Like a lot of these places, and then it's just farmland and forest. Hmm. Um, and he, as Serbia is coming back post-war 2001, it remains poor. I have to like, just underline how poor Serbia is Hmm. still, especially in its kind of hinterland. And he makes a life for himself raising horses, but then he, you have to look at the opportunities that he has. There were no jobs in Serbia after the war. There are very few jobs now. Most people who can leave. He was a good student. He liked going to school. But he and both of his brothers and his wife who grew up in the same town all went abroad. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. You talk about where you're born, what kind of opportunities you see. Look at me. 
Yeah. I went abroad. Yeah. You know, I was part of a Serbo-Croatian home. We couldn't stay anywhere. My dad was in the JNA army when they were purging Croatian officers. Wow. wow. There was no safe place for us to go. And it was like, well, we're going to go abroad. Hmm. And for him, it was like, okay, well, his family said, well, I don't know that we don't know much about university. I don't know about that. But you guys can play basketball. You know, yeah. it's not a surprise that Croatia was second in the world cup four years ago. It's not a surprise that Yugoslavia has world championship teams. Serbia has world championship basketball teams, handball team. Do you know why? Because there you either work abroad or you get good at a sport. Yeah. That's the way out. That's the way out. Yeah. Right. There are, you can certainly draw a pair. Like if I look at the NBA, NBA is a black league in the United States. Yeah. But it's also a league full of Serbo-Croatian white guys. Yeah. Yeah. And sure, okay, they're big, but there's big people everywhere. But that's what you do. Right. That's the opportunity. So I look at Jokic, he has his reputation of being a quiet guy. Do you read the Serbian uh, media? It turns out he is a quiet guy, hyper-focused on family. He says all yeah. he wants to do is be a good father and race his horses. Here's the cool thing. So, you know, that has always been an area where there's been a military outpost. Yeah. And in the 1600s, it was famous in the Hungarian Empire and then the Ottoman for having strong horsemen who made up cavalries of these armies. So Jokic is like the son of many generations of warriors. And you look at his brother, Strachonia, who names their kid the one to be feared unless they came from some point of warrior family. And he's raising horses. The NBA should be so afraid of this guy. This guy's literally a fucking cavalryman raising horses. He's telling you what he is. He's like, I'm a killer, son. I'm a killer. I'm a quiet killer. I raise horses. <laughs> Who grew up having his homeland bombed and giant petrochemical stations blowing up around him in 1999. You think you're going to shake this guy at the free throw line? <laughs> he's going to make that free throw. You think he's scared to do a half-footed pirouette left right over the right shoulder shooting with the left hand you think that scares him you think your opinion scares him america america you tried to bomb this fucker and he didn't care he is a horse raising son of warriors that's what his immigrant identity is about man i think he's gonna win 10 mvps i think two's not enough yeah people you know who else they doubted Djokovic. The tennis player? Ah, uh, yes. He's never yeah. going to be great as Federer and Nadal. I said, well, Federer and Nadal, first of all, they probably take PEDs. Second of all, my guy is going to take him too. Third of all, I did not think he was going to become an anti-vaxxer. I was disappointed in that. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> that was unfortunate. Yeah. That was unfortunate. Yeah. But you look yeah, at this guy and, and, and he says, listen, I, you know, he had a couple of small controversies um, in the NBA, but his whole goal is to go back to some point. Right. Right? right, because he says I find peace there, which is a, which is an extraordinary thing to say, considering the history. It's considering a, the history and, yeah. and the immediate history that he went through, but but home is home for him, and uh, that is a form of that's a very key part of any immigrant identity. <laughs> <laughs>